My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. A small problem left unsolved becomes a big one, and a big problem left unaddressed becomes a crisis. And that, over years, is how Canada's prairies went from seeing a soft market for wild boar meat to a few escaped animals, then unwanted animals simply set free and eventually arrived at this. An invasive pest is making its way through Alberta. And if it isn't brought under control, it could soon be laying waste in parts of Edmonton. Wild pigs are spreading across Canada at a rapid pace, destroying crops and costing the agricultural industry an estimated $1 billion. They are the worst invasive large mammal on the planet. So you say, what could be worse? I don't even know what to tell you. These huge, very destructive feral pigs that have been bred in Canada running wild there for decades, and now for the first time being spotted in the United States. This is a problem, to say the least, a crisis if you listen to the experts. It's been for a long time a prairie problem, but now wild pigs have spread as far as Ontario and B.C., and they're crossing the border and have American authorities on alert. They are known to many, as super pigs, as they combine the assets of different animals that make them uniquely suited to wreak havoc on the ecosystem, to breed at an alarming rate, and to spread across vast areas of land. For years now, researchers have been crying for action from governments, and now they say this problem is very near to spiraling completely beyond control. So where did these super pigs come from? Why are they so destructive? What can be done about them? And why have we been waiting to do it? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Ryan Brook is a professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science at the University of Saskatchewan. He is one of the researchers who has been sounding these warnings. Hey, Ryan. Good morning, Jordan. I realize I'm beginning with what kind of sounds like an origin story uh, from the comic books, but what exactly is a super pig and how did they come to be? Well, in Canada, we don't have any native pigs at all. So anything that looks like a pig and looks like a pig and lives outside a fence or out in the wild is a wild pig. And we've called them super pigs because what happened was they were introduced from the UK to be raised on farms, these wild boar. But the experts said, well, if you want a really good production, you want a bigger animal with a turbocharged reproductive rate, crossbreed those wild boar with domestic pigs. And so these hybrids ended up, what was good for production was having a wild boar that was, you know, furry, long legs, long drawn out nose, and a big thick coat of fur in the wild boar, but we added all of the benefits that come from a domestic pig. Domestic pigs actually have an extra set of ribs, and so they're longer, and they can be much larger. On our farm, when I grew up, we had uh, sows that weighed about 800 pounds. Wow. And I remember giving birth to one group that was uh, 23 babies at once, and so this huge reproductive rate. So it really supercharged these pigs and took the benefits of both of those two different kinds and made what was good for production, but unfortunately made them exceptionally good at being an invasive species and living in the wild. And so they were sort of pre-packaged, ready to go to do well in the cold Canadian winters, which a lot of people said, well, they'll never survive a Canadian winter. I mean, we get a week of 40 below up here and and lots of snow, and it can be very hard to survive. So you're saying is, uh, in our arrogance, we did this to ourselves. Well, it is a a self-inflicted wound for sure, unfortunately. And, you know, really, these animals were not contained well. And so we had lots of escapes. 
And the market in Canada peaked in 2001 for these wild boar cross hybrid animals and collapsed. And so you could barely give them away through the early 2000s. And so people cut the feds and let them go. So, oops. Yeah, major oops. Billion dollar oops. So once they were let out, where did we first start noticing them in the wild, I guess? And where have they spread since? They uh, started small. There were a few escapes to the 80s and 90s, uh, and we didn't see a whole lot even as early as 2000. But after that market collapsed, then we started to see animals on the landscape. And then and what we see now is a classic exponential curve. So through the 80s and 90s and into 2000, it, the line looks almost flat. But then very quickly into the 2010s and 2015s, it starts to curve and point towards the sky and take off. So we've seen massive exponential increase in the last five years, and 2023 is a huge record year. We're blowing up uh, all of our current accounts uh, out of the water, huge numbers showing up. And they've spread mostly through the Canadian prairie provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, but we're seeing them occurrences all the way up in the Northwest Territories in the Yukon, hmm. uh, British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, and a handful of them on the East Coast. So it is a Canada-wide concern with the overwhelming majority on the Western Canadian prairies. You mentioned that they're one of the most invasive species on the planet. I've heard you call them the most invasive animal on the planet. What do you mean by that? And how does one arrive at that conclusion? What are their specific properties that give them that title? I have called them the worst invasive large mammal on the planet for a while now, and many, many agree with me in that they have one of the lar- probably the largest range of any mammal on the planet in that they have spread to all continents. The only place you won't find wild pigs is Antarctica. They have spread over huge areas of their natural range in Europe and Asia, but they've been introduced to Australia, and Australia has something north of 17 million Uh, The United States has certainly close to 7 million. These things have taken off wherever they've been introduced, whether it's uh, small islands across the Pacific or or large uh, entire continents. They've taken over and spread across their non-native range with tremendous success. And they have the worst possible impacts that one could imagine. It's not just one piece. It's this big, long shopping list of impacts that they have. We know they... For example, they destroy water quality because uh, pigs don't have sweat glands like we do. And so when they need to cool off in the summer, they go into water and they wallow in the mud. And when they do that, they rip up vegetation, they churn up mud. And so marshes and, and streams get polluted with dirty water and they defecate in them. And so you get fecal coliforms, salmonella. E. coli, these kinds of pathogens in the water. Hmm. They will eat almost anything. So we've seen their stomachs full of salamanders, frogs, eggs from ground nesting birds, ducklings, goslings, small mammals, everything up to an adult white tailed deer, they will kill and eat. Oh, wow. They eat huge amounts of biomass, but they also tear up the landscape. Um, unlike most of our native species, These things are rooters. They get their nose in the ground and they root. They push their nose along and tear the ground up to get at roots and insect larvae. And when they leave, it looks like a bomb went off. The ground is completely torn apart. And so that takes years to recover. In, you know, many areas, you'll see some deer move into an area, graze on some grass and leave. And and you you, you have no evidence that they were even there. With pigs, you know when the pigs are there because the sign is the first thing. You see these areas of ground that looks like, uh, yeah, like a mortar went off and just tore that ground apart. What about humans? Are they dangerous? Uh, Will they attack? What are we seeing? We haven't seen a lot of attacks or or major issues in Canada, but there have been some close calls. There was a woman in Dallas, Texas a few years ago that was standing out front of her house in an urban area and a group of pigs did take her down and kill her. Wow. They can be dangerous. They're very large. You know, the biggest animal we've handled was 638 pounds. That's almost 300 kilos. That's a large animal. And they travel in groups, uh, females at least, travel in groups called a sounder group. And, you know, I've seen a sounder that weighed a little bit more than an F-150 pickup truck. And so... These things are big. They travel in big groups. They can be aggressive, and they have very large, razor-sharp tusks that are, when you when you capture these things and you're holding them, you see the two teeth back and forth against each other. 
So they have these self-sharpening Ginsu knives on their face that uh, can be very dangerous as well. So lots of reasons that we need to definitely give them a distance. As we've seen their population spike and as uh, they've spread across so much ground, how have we attempted to control those populations? And I guess what hasn't worked since uh, clearly not much has? Well, uh, around the planet, there's been a lot of work trying to reduce or eliminate them in many areas, including all of the United continents, the United States and uh, Australia as two examples of pretty aggressive attempts. And, and there have been uh, some mixed success. Certainly, the U.S. has demonstrated in four states that they have eliminated pigs. But to be fair, those were states that had low densities and fairly concentrated. Um, Once animals become widespread and abundant and fully entrenched, then there isn't really any track record of success that I'm aware of globally. So that really the only solution is to find them early and get rid of them, not unlike a cancer treatment or not unlike a forest fire, right. that you have one chance and one chance only to get it right. And if you have to be have a really good detection system so you can find it, which uh, is a challenge in and of itself, and then you need a very aggressive control strategy that goes in with uh, multiple methods to remove them. I was going to ask you about this because I know you're from a farming background. Uh, My family comes from a farming background as well. And I know that, you know, locally in those areas, when you have an infestation of an unwanted uh, animal, often the municipality will simply, you know, put out bounties on it, right? And the local farmers will will go to town when they see them on their land. And I gather that this isn't possible in this case. That's right, Jordan, exactly. That, uh, again, those all sound like reasonable options, and they have worked in some cases with some species, although rarely. Bounties almost never really work. The problem, of course, is that, well, several problems. One is that when uh, hunters go out, they're really hard to find them. These pigs are super smart. They're very elusive. They hide really well. And hunters almost never get an entire group of pigs. And so hunter success here in the Canadian prairies is about 2%. And so that has no impact on a population of pigs. And one of the things that makes them so successful and also makes them so almost impossible to eradicate is that they have this huge reproductive rate, right? These super pigs in Canada that are these hybrids, they have uh, six young per litter on average, but they have multiple litters per year. These things are continuously reproducing year in and year out. You know, your deer and your elk, they have babies in the spring and that's it. Uh, And they breed in the fall and that's it. These pigs are breeding and reproducing continuously. So, you know, we're seeing females having 12 young per year on average, which is a big number, right? And so when you have that kind of reproductive rate, you need 80% or more mortality to try and get that population from even not to eliminate them, but just to get it to stop growing. And so, obviously, 2% is a big gap from 80, so they're not having any real dent in the population. But on the flip side, they're also making it far worse by breaking up groups. So you imagine a group of 12, a hunter shoots several of them, they panic and run in different directions, and they perfectly do a great job of spreading them across the landscape into new areas. And those pigs very quickly become purely nocturnal, so they're only active in darkness. And so you can't hunt here in Canada at night. And even if you could, they'd be very, very difficult to find. And so uh, so they become highly elusive and nocturnal. And then any government control programs become at least 10 times harder to do anything because now the pigs are scattered, they're scared, they're nocturnal, and good luck finding them. And so hunting is really not only not part of the solution, it is one of the major factors that's pushed these things to now in Canada. We have them over more than 1 million square kilometers. It's a, that's bigger than most countries. Do we have any idea of the uh, raw numbers? I know you mentioned that they've been spiking and we've talked about how far they've spread. Do we know at all uh, how many pigs we're talking about here? We do not have good estimates of populations. They are incredibly hard to count because they're nocturnal, because they do spend a lot of time under the snow and under soil and under vegetation. Right. You can't just fly an aerial survey like you would for deer or elk or moose. And so they're very hard to pinpoint. The other problem, of course, is we just really haven't had any interest in Canada in getting that count. So we just haven't been able to get any funding. It's doable. We could do it using trail cameras. Uh, There just hasn't been any interest really in Canada in supporting research. So we're, we're in the dark there in terms of numbers. We're obviously well into the thousands of animals. That's, that's a given. 
Uh, we do have excellent data on their distribution and spread. So we've done, a, I think, a really good job of, of tracking where they were and where they started from with the original farms where they escaped from and now their current distribution. So we have excellent data on that, tracking them all the way from the first few occurrences in the 80s up until I got uh, two new ones last night. So hmm. so we have 62,000 occurrences across that time frame. So lots and lots of pigs spread very widely. Given what you say about, you know, their dangers to the ecosystem, why haven't you guys been able to get that funding? What have you been told? Who's holding the purse strings? Like, I mean, we're here in Toronto and, and we keep hearing about this from out on the prairies. as like a pretty urgent matter. Yeah, I've been uh, 14 years of my life. I've dedicated to this issue, to studying them and asking, then pleading, then begging for action to do something about it. You're the guy at the beginning of the horror movie that's trying to tell people what's going on. Well, that's exactly right. So many sci-fi movies start with the scientists warning everybody about the risks and everybody laughing and dismissing. And that's exactly what happened. I got laughed out of the room a lot. And People said, what are you talking about? They'll never survive a Canadian winter. Huh. And uh, here we are. There has been certainly a change in the last two years of, of there being a bit more interest. But one of the things that I, I need to make T-shirts that say meetings do not eradicate wild pigs, because unfortunately, the big outcome a lot are largely from government is have lots and lots of meetings and talk about it. And I've sort of said, you know what, I'm not coming to a meeting anymore unless everybody shows up with at least four dead pigs in the back of their truck because right. we can talk about this till the end of time, but we have to actually get serious and do something. And that that urgency has just never really been there. And still, even in 2023, we're, we're dodging dangerously close to 2024 already and just not seeing that urgency. And And also, you know, there has been a push to start ground trapping to find and remove them. And that's great. And so at least four provinces are doing that. But if that's all you do is one technique with wild pigs, then there's not much you can do. And and frankly, here on the on the prairies, we missed an opportunity to eradicate them a long time ago. Right. They are here for the next hundred years. That's certainly clear. Um, we are still very much in a stage of denial. If you look at the different stages of grief, uh, often the first one is denial. And we've been kind of stuck in that for a while. And there's still a lot of people out there uh, saying we're going to eradicate these from Canada. And that's at this point today, that's simply nonsense to even pretend that that's a reality. What could make this more urgent, especially with regards to uh, government funding? And I ask this because one of the reasons we reached out to you is because uh, the Associated Press in the United States is now covering the idea of Canadian super pigs invading the upper U.S. and there have possibly been some sightings of them. Would that be one of the things that would maybe make us uh, take this seriously? And I, I don't, I mean, I'm not joking here when I say like if the super pigs become, a, you know, an international incident. Well, that's certainly a concern that I've talked about for a while and it is very real. I mean, we have pick occurrences within, you know, less than a mile of the Canada-U.S. border and some occurrences where we're quite confident where they've crossed that border. And so it isn't a a hypothetical future scenario, this is a real today problem. So I think it is a very big concern for the U.S., especially in the context of this African swine fever disease crisis that's going on globally. And so I, I think that could potentially have some impact. But to be fair, we've had these discussions around this cross-boundary uh, for a number of years now. And this is another major push, I think, by the U.S. to really emphasize that and to some point embarrass Canada into getting their act together. So I'd like to see that. I think, honestly, I think that not a lot is going to happen in any real major way until we have a major crisis. What would that look like? Well, I, I hate to think of what the worst case scenarios could be, but it would be possibly disease related. You know, pigs can spread diseases to humans, to pets, wildlife and livestock. And certainly, as I said, this African swine fever disease is a, is a major crisis in Asia and Europe. I mean, there's literally, like Germany is has literally fenced its entire boundary with certain countries trying to keep their wild boar out to avoid African swine fever. Do we know if it's in Canada yet? It has not been found in Canada or the U.S. And there's been a lot of really good work by really good people to try and keep that out. It will not affect humans directly in that it's a pig disease only, 
But even a single case in our Canadian swine herd would be catastrophic. It would cost billions of dollars and would be at least comparable, probably worse than when we had, you know, that one case of BSE or mad cow in Canada in 2003 and all of our borders slammed shut. We couldn't sell a hamburger outside of Canada, period, for quite a long time. So, so I think that's it. But what would that crisis look like? Some kind of disease issue? Potentially someone being killed by a wild pig would certainly raise uh, a crisis to a point there. Um, And certainly any documented case. Uh, Right now, you know, we don't have GPS satellite callers out. um, So it would be hard to know even when and if pigs are crossing. There's not a a great major monitoring system in place. And so as we're talking, there could be a pig walking across the border and no one would even necessarily know about it. And so a crisis would would be pretty ugly, I think, in terms of someone being injured or killed or some kind of disease transmission event, those kinds of things that I think then uh, there might be action. The problem, of course, when things are crisis-driven is that then those actions don't necessarily reflect the best approach. They reflect a, a panic approach. So what could we do? Yes, we've mentioned more funding so that we can learn more, track better, et cetera. You mentioned ground trapping, great, but not as a sole strategy on its own. Let's say government calls you up tomorrow and puts you uh, in charge of managing this crisis. What do you do? (laughs) Uh, Sorry, I laughed that that A, that they would even call me or B, that they would give me any uh, control. But (laughs) but yeah, I mean, we definitely have good notions. I mean, I've been uh, I've been expecting a crisis for a while or at least preparing for one. And so we have plans for that. And we have a lot of I've thought about what could and should be done. Certainly, one thing we've already demonstrated through our research is the value of helicopter capture using aircraft. Uh, We'll often put up one, two, three, four airplanes to spot pigs and then have a helicopter with an infrared camera go out and uh, we can capture those pigs firing a net from a helicopter. And that one, it's very, very effective. It is not cheap, but you can get a lot done in a single day. You can cover several hundred square miles in a day quite easily. And you can find and remove a lot of pigs. Ground trapping is very good in some ways, but it takes days, weeks, or even months to capture a single group with a trap. It takes a long time. You bait them in. You slowly set up the trap. You eventually get them all in and pull the trigger and and capture them. Whereas that net gunning, you know, I go out after lunch and capture five or six groups of pigs. We've also demonstrated our research using what's called a Judas pig. So you capture a pig put a GPS satellite collar on it and let it go. And that pig will lead you to other pigs better than any other technique out there. And so we've shown that the first time you put out a GPS collar and find that group, on average, you can remove nine animals. And you could conceivably, um, we didn't have the support for it, but conceivably leave those collared animals out. So you could find a group, remove them all, leave the collared pig to keep going, and it would just keep going and finding more and more groups. And so those those approaches can be very effective. And that those three together are very complementary of each other, I think, whereas, you know, ground traps can be effective and can capture full groups and lots and lots of good reasons to do ground trapping. But again, if that's all you do, then you're really missing the boat and you need to have complementary other techniques. And uh, fencing is also, you know, good fences make good neighbors. And so having fences, at least at small scales, to keep them out of gardens and and prize rose bushes and and even, you know, certain crops and fields and keeping them away from livestock could be certainly a, a supporter of the idea of double fencing to keep pigs away from domestic pig farms. So no shortage of potential solutions, or at least things we could be doing. Oh, of course, if we were serious, there's a hundred, hundred things that we could do uh, very, very quickly, and some of them cheaper than others. And, you know, s- some of them that don't even cost a nickel, like policy changes, for example, it's open season hunting on wild pigs on the Canadian Prairie provinces right now, even though I've been advocating for well over a decade that that is, you know, the worst possible thing to do. And in fact, the governments in those provinces are also telling people that sport hunting is not part of the solution. So they're agreeing now with me, but yet it's still open season. And so, you know, I think if you want to come up with a scorecard or a, uh, a report card of, you know, who's being serious, then certainly have you banned sport hunting would be one of them. And, you know, Montana is a good example of a state that we talked to them a number of times, you know, five years ago, and I really warned them about this, and they got real serious real fast, and they said, no hunting in the state, 
of wild pigs, no raising of wild boar on farms, period. And you can't even drive one in a truck through the state and you can't transport them. So, you know, you can get real serious with policy. And, and also just if you do have the farms, which we do still have across Canada, getting those under control, uh, mandatory fencing, inspection, there's some ways that we could seal that because we still have leakage today on these farms. And you can go online. We have in Canada, we have something called Kijiji, which is sort of like your Craigslist. You can go on with cash and buy wild boar tomorrow. Back your pickup truck and and have a bread sow or, or a bunch of animals for, uh, you know, hundreds of dollars and all of a sudden either raise them on your farm, whether how well you're containing them, or just dump them in the bush to create hunting opportunities. So we have some major gaps that uh, some of them would be difficult. Some of them would be extremely doable. Ryan, thank you so much for this. It's a fascinating discussion. I hope we don't only take action after a crisis. Great to talk to you, Jordan. Dr. Ryan Brook of the University of Saskatchewan. That was the big story for more, including our previous episode on wild pigs in the prairies, which... Again, saw it as a problem, but not as big of a problem as it is now. You can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can, as always, get in touch with us. If you have a comment, question, complaint, suggestion for an episode, we would love to hear from you. And remember, we are also the same team that makes In This Economy. So if you have a money problem or a money question and you'd like some help with it, not from us, but from experts... You can reach us in the same places. The same people get your emails. I read them all. We'd love to talk to you about it. If you want to get in touch with us for either reason, you can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. The easiest way is through email. The address is hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And if you don't want to bother with any of that, you can just use your phone and call us and leave a voicemail. If you want us to get back in touch with you, though, you got to give us a way to do that. So don't forget that part of it. The phone number is 416-935-5935. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.